The April Thunders of 1944. Imagine the spring of 1944. Eastern Europe, the land, thawing after a long winter, smells of wet soil, melting snow, and burning. The air hums with distant explosions and the grinding of tracks. For Hungary, ally of Nazi Germany, the war that once seemed like a distant adventure has now arrived at its doorstep. This is the first real battle for Hungarian tankers in their pride. The medium tanks Toron 40M Model 1. From the hatches comes the smell of diesel fuel and sweat. In their ears, the deafening roar of the engine. Ahead, through clouds of smoke and dust, low, squat, fast-moving silhouettes appear. They are here, the T-30 485s, Soviet steel predators that have already become legends. The Tehran's commander shouts coordinates to the gunner. The gunner, peering into the sight, catches the gray hull of a 34 in the crosshairs. Shot. The 40mm shell flies from the barrel of the Tehran's gun with a howl. And what is that? A sliding flash. A ricochet. The shell strikes the famous sloped armor of the T-34 and bounces off like a pea off a wall, leaving only a chipped mark. The Soviet tank seems not even to notice. It smoothly turns its turret. A moment later, a blinding flash of orange flame bursts from the muzzle of its long, fearsome 85mm gun. A thunderous roar tears at the eardrums. The shell, encountering almost no resistance, pierces the armor of the Tehran like a can, like a tin can. Inside hell, fragments of armor, pieces of red-hot metal, torn off rivets. All of this flies through the cramped fighting compartment carrying death. This is not a battle. This is a beating. From a distance of one and a half kilometers, the T-34 calmly shoots down the Hungarian machines. The shells of the Tehran's either bounce off Soviet armor or cannot penetrate it even from 300 meters. This is not a clash of equals. This is the meeting of a modern weapon, tempered by years of war, with a technical anachronism that arrived late to its own war. It was a moment of truth. A bitter, bloody revelation for the entire Hungarian military apparatus. The story of the Tehran is not the story of a bad tank. It is a tragic saga of a desperate, but initially hopeless attempt by a small, proud country to run side by side with the giants of global tank development, trying to sprint like a cheetah while riding a lame horse. It is a story of how politics, economics, and the brutal wheel of history crush even the boldest engineering ambitions. Part 1. In the Grip of Necessity Why Hungary Needed Its Own Tank To understand the tragedy of the Tehran, we must rewind time to the late 1930s. Europe is a powder keg ready to explode. Hungary, recovering from the horrors of the First World War and the chaos of the Austro-Hungarian Empire's collapse, feels vulnerable. Its army is, essentially, a gendarmerie force, capable of quelling internal unrest, but not of fighting a modern war. What did Hungary have in its armored fleet? Mostly light, toldy tanks, licensed copies of the Swedish Landsverk L60. Imagine a maneuverable but fragile vehicle with bullet-resistant armor and a 20mm gun, a weapon suitable for reconnaissance or suppressing machine gun nests, but against Czech, Soviet, or German tanks, already being designed with more serious armor. The Toldy was helpless. It was like going after a bear with a slingshot. Diplomacy of desperation. Realizing its vulnerability, Budapest turned to its powerful Axis allies. Sell us your modern tanks. The German PZ. KPFW. 3. The Italian M13-40. Pleaded Hungarian generals. But the response was harsh and humiliating. The Germans, with their pragmatic arrogance, saw the Hungarians as junior, unreliable partners. Share advanced technology? Never. They would supply older models, and only in limited numbers, when they had surpluses. The Italians, themselves forever behind, were also unwilling to strengthen a neighbor's army. Hungary was forced to face a harsh truth. In global politics, you either forge your own sword or become the anvil. Relying on foreign supplies was a dead end, especially when a world war was looming. So, Hungary reached a fateful decision. We must build our own medium tank. 
a tank not just as a machine, but as a symbol of national resurgence, proof that Hungary could stand among industrial powers. But this task was monumental. The country lacked experience in designing such complex vehicles, lacked advanced technology, lacked industrial capacity. It was like deciding to build a spaceship with nothing but a bicycle workshop. Part 2. An Unexpected Gift The Czechoslovak Roots of the Turan Fate, as it often does, provided a surprising opportunity. In March of 1939, Nazi Germany occupied Czechoslovakia. A tragedy for the Czechs, but a treasure trove for the German and then Hungarian military. The Czech industry, especially Skoda and KD, was among the most advanced in Europe. Among the projects that fell into German hands was a promising medium tank, the Skoda T-21. The Germans, already working on their PZ-3 and PZ-4, viewed the Czech design with characteristic snobbery and showed little interest. It was decent, but not up to German standards. Someone in the Reich ministry then had a clever bureaucratic idea. Why not give this project to Hungary? It would strengthen Hungary somewhat, but not too much. It required no German resources, and it ensured the Hungarians wouldn't develop anything truly competitive. And so, the drawings of the T-21 arrived in Budapest. For Hungarian engineers, they were manna from heaven. They had a complete, well-developed design they could build upon. But they did not simply copy it. They began a major redesign. Hungarian modifications to the T-21. Armor. The original 20, 30 millimeters were laughable. The armor was increased to 50, 60 millimeters. A step forward, but installed almost vertically. A critical mistake. Crew. Increased to 5, commander, gunner, loader, driver, radio operator. Cupola. Added a commander's cupola for better visibility. Industrial adaptation. Everything adjusted to Hungarian factories, materials, and tools. Both a blessing and a limitation. In November of 1940, the new tank was proudly accepted into service as the 40M Turan, named after the mythical ancestral homeland of the Hungarians. The name was meant to inspire pride, but the tank was already outdated the day it was born. Part 3. The Turan in Detail. Anatomy of a Failure. 1. Armor. Trusting yet fragile. Imagine a tall box with flat sides. That was the Turan. Its frontal armor, 50, 60 millimeters, almost vertical. Now picture the T-34. Low, wedge-shaped, with brilliantly angled armor. Physically, the sloped 45 millimeter armor of the T-34 effectively equaled 90, 100 millimeters. The Turan's shell struck an obstacle twice as strong. But the greatest nightmare was the riveted construction. Like old locomotives or ships, the armor plates were held together by thousands of rivets. When hit, even without penetration, the shock tore rivets loose. They flew inside like metal bees, killing crews. The Soviet all-welded hull was far safer. 2. Armament A mosquito fighting an elephant. Turan I, a 40mm gun, penetrating 42mm at 300m. Hopeless by 1944. Turan II, a short 75mm gun, good for infantry support, useless against tanks. Turan III, a long 75mm gun, theoretically adequate but too late. Meanwhile, Soviet 76mm F-34, up to 69mm at 300m. Soviet 85mm SS-53, over 100mm at the same distance. 3. Mobility, the heavy breathing of an asthmatic. 260 horsepower, 19 tons, only 43 kilometers per hour. The T-34 had 500 horsepower, better mobility, better reliability, longer range, safer diesel fuel. The Turan could not maneuver, could not retreat fast, could not flank. It was simply a moving target. 